Hi, I'm John Kosar. It is May 10th, 2022, and this is our first free monthly video on our brand new YouTube channel, uh, The Asbury Approach to Investing. We're going to do one of these every month. And what this is, is a brief compilation of what we're watching, what we're sending the clients, the charts that we think are important, and an updated version of a number of our quantitative models, which try to look underneath the hood of the market to tell us what's really going on. If you like this video, please subscribe here, right on the YouTube channel. And if you'd like to learn more about us, there's another video here, it's called About Asbury Research. And it's uh, relatively short, three or four minutes, and it goes through who I am, who Asbury Research is, and what we do for our subscribers. So let's get to the good stuff and look at some markets. Let's begin with a, just a gen, kind of a general view of the S&P 500. This is the daily chart of the S&P 500. It goes back to 2021, and we put a 200-day and a 50-day moving average in there, orange on the 200, blue on the 50, to kind of give the chart some structure here so we can see what the trend is. So you can see we're below both of the moving averages. We are pretty obviously in a downtrend. And the important takeaway here, I think, is that we're sitting right on the support level, 39.84 to 39.50. Um, I wouldn't say it's a formidable level, but it's kind of a port in the storm for a market that's really getting beat up. So this is a place that we may see some kind of a bounce. However, the major trend will stay intact as long as we stay above this 4,500 area right here. Uh, it includes a 200-day moving average and the high from the end of April. Um, more close to the market support here is 40, let's call it 4,300. Um, so there's a lot of room for the market to bounce here and still not disturb these major and minor trends. Relative performance is a real big thing for our shop. Relative performance really gives you a lot more, I think, meaningful understanding of what the condition of the market is rather than the up 100 and down 100 stuff that we've been seeing more and more. So this is the SOX index right here, Philex Semiconductor Index up top, going back again to 2021 daily chart, 200 day moving average. You can see we broke the 200 day on January the 24th, came back up to retest it at the end of March, failed, and we're making fresh lows. Down underneath here is the daily relative performance of SOX versus SPY, which of course is the ETF that tracks the S&P 500. You can see that we broke through this 63-day moving average. 63 days is one business quarter. That's our strategic time period. So we broke that on January the 19th, indicating the SOX is now underperforming SPY on a strategic basis. And um, we stopped here on the relative performance line right at the May 2021 relative underperformance lows by the SOX, having a little bit of a bounce here, but the trend is still intact. The market needs leadership in order to turn around and start going higher again. The typical places you get leadership are small cap, tech, and um, semiconductors. And right now, none of these are leading. Here's the NDX here on the right. Um, this chart's the same in that it goes back to 2021. 20, you can see that NDX broke it's 200-day moving average on Jan 20, indicating a major bearish trend change. Came right down to support at the May 12 low um, at the end of February. Bounced up to the 200-day, stayed there about a minute, and came right back down. And we're sitting right on that May 12 low area again, 12,967. So another place where the market is finding support. When the market's getting crushed like it is over the past few weeks, it's looking for a place where it can hang on for dear life. And uh, that support level in the S&P and the one here in the NDX are places that you might expect a little bump. Uh, let's look at relative performance in the NDX. Started underperforming SPY on a 63-day basis, um, strategic basis for us on December the 15th. Um, made a fresh relative performance low, uh, relative underperformance low, came up broke the 63-day moving average for about a, a day or two, and now we're making fresh relative performance extreme, relative underperformance extreme. So there's a lot of weakness here. 
influential stocks. There's a bunch of them that we have been showing clients, but for our purposes today, we're gonna to try to make this short and sweet, <clears throat> is here's Apple going back a couple of years. Apple has been riding its 200 day moving average for more than a year now. It's sitting at it now, starting to lean underneath it. Meantime, relative performance, Apple versus SPX. Apple has been trying to exceed its September 2020 relative outperformance extreme versus SPX since before Christmas time last year, and it's tested it numerous times since then. So this is a big deal for Apple, something to really watch in Apple. If Apple rolls over here, it's number one in market cap, carries a lot of weight in the stock market, and if it rolls over on a relative, relative basis here, it's gonna make it even harder for the S&P 500 to find a support level that it's gonna stick and it's gonna be able to begin some kind of a sustainable rally from. This is Tesla. This is uh, number five in market cap, but Tesla really caught my eye because look at this indecision in Tesla since November of last year. This coil is getting tighter and tighter and tighter, which means the market's going into the turtle. Um, investors are going into the turtle here. They can't really make new highs. They can't really make new lows. So you keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking in terms of the range. Um, in the meantime, relatively, it's sitting on top of its 63-day moving average. Looks like it might be ready to roll over. If Tesla breaks the bottom uh, edge of this investor indecision area here at around 839 a share, that's bad news. That tells me that we can get a much bigger move, potentially down to 540. So it's a major decision point for me. And again, number five in market cap carries a lot of sway with the market. And we ran a linear correlation study with Tesla and the S&P 500. And the correlation has been tight and steady um, going back many years. Our correction protection model is one of many quantitative models that we use to determine what the condition of the market is. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing this 40 some years. I do a lot less forecasting now and a lot more reading of the data uh, and trying to not tell the future, um, foretold the future. Nobody can do that. The future hasn't happened yet. And rather just try to read the data. And that's what our models do. The first version of CPM was built about 10 years ago um, at the request of many money manager clients of ours that said, can you just build me a model that tells me when it's risk on and when it's risk off. So I know when I can start adding adding money to portfolios and when I need to start to protect my clients. So we built CPM and we built it with the idea that it was gonna be defensive. So what we did was, uh, by the way, just a little segue here. Here's CPM has been risk off now since April the 12th. And you can see we got signals going back here. Uh, it went to risk off most recently on Jan 18 back to risk on on March 18 and risk off as of April 12th. It's a binary model. It's either risk on or risk off. It's quantitative objective and data driven. Everything we do here is data driven. Uh, we use CPM as a key indication of when to increase exposure, which is risk on and when to be risk averse, which is risk off. So what we found trading CPM with uh, the S&P 500 or SPY um, over the past 11 years through 2021, um, it's trailed the S&P by 3.4% a year, I believe, on average. You can go to the website, esburyresearch.com, and go to the Models tab, and there's all this information there, and you can get more specific information. But basically, um, the beta during that time on CPM is 0.43 rather than 1% for the S&P 500. So you're taking, according to Betty, you're taking less than half the risk, taking more than half of the risk out of the market. And look at the maximum drawdown here, only 15% for CPM versus 34% for the S&P 500. The trade-off for that, and there's always a trade-off, is it underperforms a little bit on average for the past 11 years. But then we found if you use a leveraged ETF, you could build some of the risk back in and change the performance numbers. We don't advocate people using leveraged ETFs or leveraged products. They're um, dangerous. Um, disclosure here that 
talk to your financial professional and find out if this is appropriate for you. But just for the purposes of trying to explain to you how the model works, we found that using a double leveraged um, S&P 500 ETF, it brings our beta up to 85, still a little less than the S&P at 1%. Brings our maximum drawdown up to 30%, still a little less than the 34% for the S&P 500, but now we're outperforming the S&P on average annually for the past 11 years by 6% and change. Um, so again, there's more information on the website. Check that out. And again, please, um, past performance does not mean that you could take this to the bank and somebody gives you a check. It does not mean it's going to work in the future, but in that nobody can see the future because it hasn't happened yet. This is the best that we have, and this is what we use to try to find risk-averse ways for our clients to make money in the markets. The other uh, two tactical models, the other one outside of CPM is the Asbury 6. The Asbury 6 is more of an indicator. Uh, we built the Asbury 6 because of what the S&P 500 does now. The way the character of the market has changed, the market is run, I think, day-to-day. -day. Largely, the volume day-to-day -day comes from algorithmic trading, computers trading with each other. And I think they exert kind of a financial jujitsu on investors in that last week was a poster boy for that. I think last Thursday, the S&P was up 120, 130, and on Friday, it was down 130. You can't watch the S&P 500 anymore and make any kind of a reasonable determination by itself of what the market's going to do. So we built the Asbury 6. And the Asbury 6 includes one part, price-driven part, the monthly rate of change in the S&P 500. But the other five are things that can't be controlled by computers trading with each other during the day, like relative performance of uh, stock versus bond prices, investor asset flows, corporate bond spreads, trading volume, market breadth. You can see that uh, the A6, the Asbury 6, also went to negative on April the 12th. It went to negative on Jan 14, back to positive on St. Patrick's Day here, March 17th, Green Arrow, and back to, back to negative on April the 12th. So both tactical models are telling us risk off here since April the 12th. Here's what it looks like. We update this every day on our research center. That is the paid part of our website. Uh, this is updated a couple hours after the close every day. And you can see right now they're all red. Red means negative, And these are the dates that each of these individual constituents most recently turned to negative when and four or more in one direction indicates a directional signal. So we would need four of these turn back to positive or green that show up green here in order to give us a positive signal for the Asbury 6 and tell us that it's time to reallocate some of that capital that we took out of the market on April the 12th when CPM and A6 went through negative and went to risk off. Let's look at a few more indicators that I think are important here. This is the VIX. We see the 24 area in the VIX as a line of demarcation between just a normal pullback that you could buy or a correction or a downtrend that you may want to avoid. So you can see that we've been above 24 in the VIX since April the 22nd, about 10 days after both of our tactical models went to risk off. As long as the VIX can't get back below 24 and stay there, we're gonna be looking at rallies with a lot of skepticism. Strategic momentum, we have a couple of different indicators to um, try to determine what this is. This is a very simple one. So <coughs> excuse me. It's a 13 week rate of change in the S&P 500. You can see it's been negative since January the 21st. That means we're in a downtrend. Um, we're either in a correction or a downtrend. And right now, we, our view is we are in a downtrend in the S&P 500. Um, you can see the last two times that it went below the zero line was February to May of 2020. That was right when we made the COVID lows. That was that nasty 35% top to bottom that we had right during the COVID, the heart of COVID. And then prior to that, uh, October 2018 to February of 2019. So bigger picture, 32,000 feet, as long as we are still underneath the zero line in this indicator, we're still in a bear market. We're still in a downtrend. 
Here's some seasonality. Seasonality is not something that we spend a lot of time paying attention to. It's tertiary for us, but seasonality is important when it overlays with what the market's doing right now. The market's in a downtrend right now. And seasonally, this is an annual seasonal chart, 12 columns for the 12 months of the year. You can see the May to September period highlighted here includes five of the six weakest months of the year. So I look at seasonality like I would look at wind. Um, if you're riding your bicycle and the wind is at your back, it's going to make you go faster. Right now, the market is pointed down and the wind is pushing it down faster. Here's a quarterly version. There's 13 bars here for the 13 weeks of the second quarter. Here's May, that's bracketed off here. The final three weeks of May and the final three weeks of June include the six weakest weeks of the entire second quarter. So there's the market is pointed down and there's a lot of wind at its back right now to push it down lower. This is our CART model, cross asset relative performance. And what we do here, this is updated every week, um, once a week, on the weekends, in the research center. There are eight equity related relative performance comparisons here. <clears throat> and there are three fixed income down here. Um, we're looking at relative performance comparisons in three different time frames trading, which is five days, tactical, which is 21 days, strategic which is 63 days, and then we're looking for trends across the various time periods. So right now, you're seeing bonds outperforming stocks, low volatility stocks outperforming high beta, large cap outperforming small, the Dow 30 blue chips outperforming the broad market S&P, S&P outperforming the tech, uh, tech index, the NDX, um, value outperforming growth. That's a defensive, defensive alignment. This started showing up defensive four to six weeks ago. So the carp was showing us the market was kind of going into the turtle and getting ready for bad things to happen before it really started to get hit hard, the S&P 500. So this is a model that we use, one, to find relative opportunities, overweight, underweight, and two, just to give us a very good snapshot of what the internal condition of the market is, how these indexes are aligning with each other. Here's one of those. This is the this is the low volatility versus high beta. Since November the 26th, it's been in a strategic trend of outperformance and is outperformed by 17%. SPLV, um, which is the low vol, has outperformed the S&P 500 by 15% during the same period. So again, for somebody who needs to be in the market, a lot of money managers can't go to cash. They can go to some cash but they basically need to be invested. This is getting you into places where if you're not beating the S&P, you're outperforming it. And in a market that's going down where you must be invested, your clients will be very happy with that. Here's, a, here's another model. This is US versus the world. It looks at those same three time periods, trading tactical and strategic, but now we're measuring the S&P 500 versus 24 foreign markets. So right now it's showing 11 of the 24 foreign countries are outperforming the S&P on both a tactical and strategic basis, which in our view are the two most important time periods. Um, one of those, or two of those, we have two here. Here is Brazil. Uh, the US versus the world model started pointing towards South America very early in the year. Uh, and Brazil, Chile, and Peru uh, were identified by the model as places where you could look for some relative outperformance while the S&P 500 was struggling. Well, this is Brazil, and we entered this, according to the model, on January the 18th as an overweight, and we are out of that trade now because we've broken the 200-day moving average in EWZ, which is the ETF for the Brazilian market, and the quarterly trend of relative outperformance died right here on May 2nd. So we left this idea with a 21% outperformance during just a few months. Here's one that is current, but it's being tested. This is Mexico. Our model identified Mexico at the end of the year, very beginning of this year. It's outperformed SPY by 11% since then, testing that strategic trend of relative outperformance. If it fails and rolls through here, 
and we make a steady breakdown through the 200-day moving average, we will ring the cash register on that idea and pick up some outperformance again while the S&P 500 is having a tough time. This is our CIF model. CIF still uses those same three time periods, trading tactical strategic, but now we're measuring asset flows moving around the sector space rather than waiting for relative performance to be to be seen on the chart, you know, to become apparent on the chart. So these signals are quicker. They tend to get you into ideas faster and keep you in there a little bit longer. So currently, the money is coming out of financials. We're looking for trends again across time periods, coming out of financials, coming out of communication services, going into uh, consumer staples, going into healthcare. Um, and then there's a residual signal that we've had since the beginning of the year, and that is energy. Here's that chart. So energy first showed up on our model on January the 4th uh, on the CIF model, and it has been steadily, it has been the only sector that has been a steady buy and overweight entry on CIF since the beginning of the year. You can see that since Jan 4, it's outperformed SPY by 63%. So in a year where the market's going down, it's tough to find opportunities. This has been a really good place to be um, uh, for our subscribers. Uh, it's made a tough year a lot more palatable. Um, a little bit more about CIF here, a little back testing on CIF. You can see the beta on CIF is 0.93% versus 1%, of course, for the S&P. A touch less risky than the S&P in terms of beta. Um, maximum drawdown, 12.1 versus 9.6. So a little bit more of a drawdown, but the performance is quite a bit better. You can see the total return um, is much better in SEAF than in the S&P 500. And the annualized total return is quite a bit better. It's about 33% better just eyeballing this. And then if you look at the chart, um, you can see SEAF is in green, S&P 500 is in blue you can see that the wiggles are pretty close because it's a subset of the S&P 500, the signals that we are seeing in CIF, but you can see CIF overtook um, S&P 500 in February, March of 2021. That's when we were overweight energy and financials, and they both came out of nowhere and they hit a bang up like five month period, and we caught some outperformance there, and now we've caught more outperformance here this year because we've been overweight the energy space. So there you have it. This is a pretty good, quick overview of what we do, how we look at markets, what our style is. Um, if, you, if you like this video, we're gonna do one of these every month. Subscribe right here on our YouTube channel. If you want more information about us, there's another video here called About Asbury Research. You could watch that. It'll tell you a little bit about how I started in the business, what we do, um, and how we look at markets. And uh, if you'd like information about our premium service, feel free to go to the contact tab on our website, asburyresearch.com, and fill that out with your name, phone number, email address, and we'll find out what kind of an investor you are. We work with both money managers and individual investors, and we will send you some pricing and service options for yourself. Thanks for listening, and we will see you in about a month with our next one.